Allora, as we say in Italy, it is now six o'clock, uh, Rome time. Uh, I don't know, maybe Tosca is actually Toscana, even though the character Sardou probably made was, was not necessarily from Toscana, I think from Verona. But um, here we are with the great maestro, Frederick Chazlin, and he is here to offer us his wisdom, his experience, his knowledge of an extraordinary amount of performances that he has made of Puccini's masterpieces, La Boheme and Tosca, as well as um, giving us insight into the performance practice and style of Puccini, particularly as we will be celebrating this year the centenary of his death. This is the Puccini year. Everybody's going to want to be doing Puccini. And if you have the chance to do Puccini, this is going to be an invaluable opportunity to learn from one of the most experienced and active conductors today, not just in the opera pit, but also on the stage. A great conductor, a great composer, uh, probably a really great chef, too, considering his bouillabaisse recipe. I introduce everyone to you, Maestro Frederic Cheslan. Thank you so much for being a part of our CMO Great Maestro's Repertoire Masterclass Series, Maestro. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Buonasera. Thank you and good evening. Uh, good morning. I don't know where everybody's coming from different uh, time zones. So um, I don't know what is the majority of our uh, audience, but I say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, anything. Um, yes, um, I was very thrilled to um, take this offer of John to speak about those two operas. Um, I'm not going to give you a musicologist uh, lecture. I'm going to give you a very practical, uh, not lecture, I don't like this word because I'm not a professor. Uh, I gave master classes at my or different positions in different orchestras, but really freely to students who had questions, very practical question to ask. Uh, because this is exactly how I was educated with uh, Pierre Boulez and Daniel Barenboim, never on a never on a theoretical level, but always on a very practical level. Because you will, um, I suppose, most of you are still student or are starting their career, and the first obstacle that you will hit are practical obstacle. So of course, the theory is helping a lot, and the more you know. The best, uh, the best armed you are uh, to uh, to go through those ob obstacles. So I'm going to share with you my little experience about Tosca and Bohem, just because those are the two uh, operas that are performed the most, and that's probably um, the one of the two operas that you will be offered to conduct um, for sure. I bet you will. Uh, you won't have an offer to conduct uh, La Rondine or Sanchula del West that are very rarely. Uh, perform the comparison to Bohem and Tosca. And to think that this is a Puccini year, my dear John, I would say, what is that going to change? Because I mean, this th those two operas are the cash machine of every theater. So the idea- yeah, Every year is Puccini year, it seems. <laughs> It's a permanent Puccini year, but for those two operas. So what I wish for this Puccini year is that we will hear a little bit more Rondine, a little bit more, because let's say we have uh, Tosca, Bohème, Butterfly, Turandot, and then um, probably Janice Kiki, uh, and then we go to the obscure zone of the operas that are much less performed. Manon Lesco is next, and then far, far, far beyond is La Rondine. I did one La Rondine, but... Um, uh, it's very rare. In, a, in any case, all those operas have one thing in common, and guess what? It is Puccini. So what is Puccini, uh, Puccini's challenges com in compared to all other composers? Well, I would say um, for every opera that you uh, conduct, of course, uh, the challenge is to know uh, the style and the tradition. So remember, tradition, uh, the, the great word of Gustav Mahler, uh, he said, tradition is to forward the fire and not to worship the ashes. Uh, and that's true. Um, there is a fire in tradition. There is a fire and there are, there are ashes. Ashes are the bad tradition, are the tradition made by, let's say the best traditions are made by the composer themselves still when they are still alive. So when you have a chance to listen to a composer 
who is either mm, conducting his own music like Stravinsky, playing his own music like Rachmaninoff, you are blessed. And you can follow this tradition because then you will forward the fire. If you <clears throat> follow traditions that have been made by most of the worst tradition have, made, have been made by singers. I, I, there is no opera singers in the audience, but they are the most ex exquisite and intelligent people. And they are sometimes less intelligent mm, singers who um, start traditions and they start sometimes the bad traditions. And if they are very famous, they are followed by conductors and other conductors then start to follow this. So this is, this is the bad tradition. About Puccini, <clears throat> You have, um, okay, this, the style is very, very tricky for, for Puccini because what we know of the difficulty of conducting Puccini is the famous Puccini rubato. So what is about the rubato? Most of it is not written. Most of it is not written. I don't even speak about the fermatas because Puccini wrote quite fast and he was not uh, a champion of uh, re-editing, let's say. Once, once it was published, he just wanted to write his next opera. It was not like Stravinsky making a new edition with ads uh, of um, the first performance of, on the first performance, except for Butterfly that he completely read it. But that's for another reason. That's because Butterfly was not a success at the first. <clears throat> but for instance, uh, since we have, uh, we have Bohème, let's speak about tradition. Let's speak about fermata. Uh, if you follow what what Puccini wrote, for instance, um, in the in the area of Rodolfo, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. We've just lost your sound. Oh, you lost my sound. It's too bad. I made now it. you're back. Okay, so um, when you have the try again, big... try again. Now we have your sound. Maybe it was too loud for the for the phone. Yeah, it doesn't come across. It doesn't come across with the pianoforte. But maybe you can explain to us. Oh, uh, as soon as I play the piano, the the computer the sound crashes. goes out. Okay, so I will have to sing. Sorry for you guys because that will be... <laughs> conductor but... singing. Bravo! We love that. most most. <laughs> I prepared most of my examples to be performed on the piano, so it's a pity, and I just tuned my stay anyway. Okay, uh, uh, when you have Rodolfo in his big aria singing, uh, Perche poiche, poiche, oh, look, and, uh, from conductors are very bad, but singing, Poiche, poiche, my vocals dance, Okay, well, what he wrote here, he just wrote allargando, so he didn't even write fermata. <laughs> You know, so try try to convince the tenor today not to do that fermata, and even better, you know, all, all of you know Nessun Dorma and Turandot and Villa, the famous Vincera. Vincera, and then it's written here poco allargando Vincero. So try to try to con to try to convince to uh, a tenor not to do that fermata. It would be like trying to stop a plane on the runway. When it's about to when it's about to take off, it's absolutely impossible. So those are, I would say, the good the good tradition. This is the fire. This said, um, the rubato that is uh, obvious, like those two places, is something. When we're talking about um, Bohème, we have trickiest rubatos. For instance, let's take the beginning. <clears throat> The beginning of the act or the last act. Okay, we have uh, Rodolfo. So I, I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going to be able to play. That's really a bummer. Uh, let's take the beginning of the. Uh, of the Maybe last if you act. move the, the 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 telephone, if you move it a little bit closer to the piano, it picks up the volume. I think it was just too much sound for the for the uh, microphone of your of your phone. You can try. Okay. No, maybe I have to play uh, softer. You know. No. Okay. So you have. Uh, okay, you have this very beautiful uh, duet at the beginning of the last act between Rodolfo and, and Marcello. Is that, is that okay? Not very good? So here as well, he didn't write anything. He absolutely wrote absolutely nothing. But of course, here you have to um, you have to adapt. So I would say here, this is my little uh, theory about the tempo. There is not 
uh, a conductor's tempo and there is not even a singer's tempo. The best tempo is always the tempo that makes the singer sound to its best. And believe me, a lot of singers don't have any idea of what is the best tempo for them. Um, but I never impose my tempo. I'm always looking, according to the voice, to the best tempo for one specific singer. So here, if you have uh, Rodolfo that is very young and has a very thin voice, of course, you don't want to drag too much. <laughs> Don't let that, don't let that, uh, this one become the Avincero. That's a perfect allargando, you know, but not, not a fermata for sure. Because this is repeating so many times that the Rodolfo, Marcello goes on. Io non so come si so they go together. So here are already the second time. So the second time you can do it a little bit more. And then you have the third time where Puccini as well never wrote any rubato, but they sing together. We're losing you. Yeah. I was just showing you, you know, the, the third instance of that theme they sing together, they sing together. Right. So here, of course, slow down. Uh, this is actually, this one is one of the trickiest place in the, uh, in the entire opera. Um, as well, you have the ear, one of the problems that many conductors um, don't know how really to face at the beginning is, uh, okay, subdivide or not subdivide. About subdivision, I have a good uh, anecdote to tell you. Um, I've been very lucky to collect over 250 times at the Vienna State Opera. And um, the musicians of, of the opera are the, are the Vienna Philharmonic, so fabulous, fabulous orchestra. And one of them, uh, who is now now retired, Martin Gabriel, was the solo oboe. And at the end of a at the end of a show conducted by a colleague that I won't name, um, he told me, well, this guy was not feeling um, comfortable. He was not feeling comfortable with the opera. I said, well, how, do you, how did you sense that? Well, well, because he was subdividing all the time where it's not necessary. So the fact of subdivising depends totally of the orchestra that you have in front of you. Here, for instance, I would say, if you conduct the Vienna Philharmonic and the Vienna State Opera, you just let them play with it. You just let, let them accompany the singer because they love to accompany the singer. So you can perfectly do... I, don't, I absolutely don't stop the movement, you see? Uh, because here yeah, I don't, I don't want, we, we don't want the fermata. Okay, if you have two uh, two stars, when you had the Pavarotti and the, uh, and the Nucci, for instance, and they, they told you, no, my so here we do a fermata. Well, okay, you just shut your mouth and uh, let them do what they want. But because there, there is a way, there is a limit that you cannot um, cross. Um, it's always um, it's always a game between uh, who is the most famous, who, is, who has the biggest fee, and who has all the girls. Well, I'm just kidding. Um, so here we have we have, we certainly have to decide what is the orchestra capable of doing. And I have some orchestra. You feel it very quickly. I had some orchestra where I felt that I really had that. Da, da, di, da, di, da. The, the Lauren Mazel, you know, Lauren Mazel was subdividing every 60 notes. I saw him sometimes connecting, for instance, at the end of Tosca. Uh, Lauren was doing that. I was a good friend of Lauren, and he was doing that. Even that. So, hmm. And, and and in Vienna, for instance, you just do it. I remember the at in Vienna, they listen so well to the singers. Those I just had to, I just had to something like that, you know, move a little bit the fingers. <laughs> That's very so that depends totally of the orchestra that you have. But <clears throat> let's talk about the beginnings now. But before I talk about the beginnings, we I was I want I want to close the chapter of traditions. 
what is traditional, what are the rubatos we saw that divide, subdividing, not subdividing, depending of uh, the amount of uh, the amount of tradition that you want to bring them in rubato, etc. Probably for a young conductor who would conduct for the first time uh, Potoska or Bohem, a very interesting source about tradition would be to listen to the recordings made at the time where Puccini was alive, and not only alive, but was present, was in the room. 